session two of Puerto Rico from West Side Story to Maria. And today we get to talk about West Side Story. And I get to tell you why they were, there were so many Puerto Ricans in New York, which is really the backstory of West Side Story. So um, the title of the presentation today is Commonwealth and Operation Bootstrap. And the image is really the image that represents uh, what happens both in Puerto Rico and in the United States because of, um, because of this transformation on the island, which is a push towards industrialization. Um, and most of the workers in this push towards industrialization ended up being women. Um, both in factories in Puerto Rico plus in factories in the United States. So, Why is that? Mostly because it had to do with needlework and textiles. Although the industry that was developed uh, ranged a variety of sectors, there had been a history of needlework in uh, Puerto Rico that people did to supplement the work they did in the sugarcane industry. Um, because of the dead time, right, the seasonal work, the only way that they could make up money was to do by pieces needlework. Um, and that sort of outsourcing and um, kind of individual contractor work disappears completely once Operation Bootstrap begins and you have actual American factories moving to Puerto Rico um, and doing I don't know, like Victoria's Secrets did uh, when the Caribbean Free Trade Basin was began in the 1980s. Before that came Operation Bootstrap, um, Maquiladoras Assemblage, right? So that's the kind of work that they did. But because there was that background, a lot of the women who moved to the United States, first during the um, Depression in 19, late 20s and 30s, and then when they move en masse, in 1950s and 60s, end up working in textile industry in New York City. Yes? Um, during that period, there were immigration quotas by, by nation. Did, did Puerto Rico have a quota, or, or was there free immigration? From Puerto Rico? I'm just going to write something on the board. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but Thanks to the Jones Act, Puerto Ricans are Americans. So it was since 1917. Puerto Ricans are Americans. And this is the tension that happens when we have the quota laws, right? That the quota laws actually didn't really cover Latin America. Um, fast forward to, if you guys want to take the immigration class that I will be teaching in the fall on this subject. <laughs> but it is interesting that the focus of quota laws was Europe and Asia and not Latin America. So when you look at history of U.S. immigration, it's always trying to undo the mess that the law makes in the previous iteration of trying to fix another mess. Right, so when the quota laws begin in the 19, really restrictionism begins in 1917, but it takes full force in 24 and 25, and then it continues to be restricted. And during that period, you have the extension of citizenship to Native Americans, which they didn't have since the 19th century, the extension of citizenship to Puerto Ricans for very specific reasons that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. But, but also the quotas didn't apply to Latin Americans. So that is one of the interesting aspects is that when we tend to think of immigration problems in the United States today, the focus usually specifically in this administration is towards Latin America, specifically Mexico or Central America, right? Not in the 1920s. But aside from all of that, Puerto Ricans were made by law citizens. So they had ease of movement. The only barrier for them was to pay for the ticket. 
And as we will see in some videos that we have, uh, the first uh, in the 1920s to come to the United States, it was $25, yeah. and then it was 45 But for a family in Puerto Rico to pay that kind of money was very expensive because they lived in agricultural society, right? So um, I will let the video show it, but mostly they would take turns. They, uh, one family would get the money together for one person to go. And then when there was enough money, somebody else would go. But the big wave of immigration really doesn't begin until Operation Bootstrap. Um, it's one of those instinctively we think that that shouldn't be the consequence of industrialization. But it's the coupling of industrialization with this policy that comes from the Jones Act, right, that creates a migration that is not just rural to urban, which is the traditional path of migration when you have an industrializing country. And that has been the path of migration in every Latin American country that attempted industrialization or pretty much every country that attempted industrialization. But in the United States and Puerto Rico, you had an extra pathway because you, they were American citizens. So they could come here without any problems. And they did. So I want to tell a little anecdote. When I moved to New York ooh, many years ago to start graduate school, I was walking around the village and I encountered this coffee company that has been open since 1907. And I was told that this was probably the best place to get coffee in. I'm from Costa Rica, I like my coffee, so I went there. But it annoyed me to no end that it was called Puerto Rico. That's not the name, it's Puerto Rico, right? When the Foraker Act is passed, when the Americans take over Puerto Rico, they change the name of the place to Puerto Rico. And it remained Puerto Rico until 1932. So it wasn't only that they annexed the island, and we'll summarize again everything that the Foraker Act did, took away their sovereignty, whatever they had gotten right through the um, Autonomy Act that they had had from the Spanish briefly for one brief month and a half or however long that was. But they also took away their language, right, in instruction and education from Spanish to English, tried to Americanize the country and change its name, which in Spanish makes no sense because Anyway, because of orthographic laws and grammar, right? So this is why there is a Puerto Rico coffee company in New York, because it opened in 1907. And when Puerto Rico changed back its name, it was already so well known as a brand, they couldn't change the name to the actual name. Was it good? Yes, it was really good. <laughs> this is not a paid ad. No, it was coffee from pretty much everywhere. But I mean, the, 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 what is interesting is that it never occurred to them, or I mean, who knows who the owner is now, that they could change the name to the correct name of the country. But this is a slice of what colonial policy was towards the island in the beginning of the 20th century. And it's still in the streets of New York. Well, there was coffee growing, right, in Puerto Rico, but another thing that happens in, when the Americans come is that whatever else was being produced on the island was completely erased by the transformation of the economy into a monoculture uh, producing just sugar. All the money that the United States invested in, the, in Puerto Rico went to sugar production. So it's also another extra slice, right, of a kind of frozen in amber <laughs> that the presence of the United States completely changed the nature of what life on the island was like. Well, I mean, they do remember that in the Foraker Act, in the Foraker Act, we, the United States, set the tariffs 
for Puerto Rico. We didn't, this is part of the law in the insular cases that I'm going to talk about in a minute that we sort of rushed at the end of last week. The insular cases began because of tariffs and importation and taxation. And the court decides that Puerto Rico is treated not necessarily as other territories would be treated, right? So again, the Constitution didn't follow the flag. That puzzle, right, Puerto Ricans are immigrants. Puerto Rico can be importing because what they're really just doing supposedly is moving goods from there to here, right? But as we know from the Jones Act, which we talked about and which became a huge issue during Maria, there is, um, there is an aspect of the law that foreign ships cannot stop in Puerto Rico before bringing their goods here because Puerto Rico doesn't have the ability to control their export imports with other countries because they're part of the United States, right? And this has been greatly debated. The Jones Act had to be suspended momentarily and it was a big fight during Maria. Um, and the insular cases that we're gonna talk about in a minute are also very important for a decision that was made last night, late, late last night in federal court that has to do with the debt a uh, package that was passed in 2016 called PROMESA, which put the bondholders for the debt in Puerto Rico on a box that they couldn't collect until Puerto Rico restructured its debt, its economy. Federal court yesterday decided that the bondholders have a right to collect from Puerto Rico, which actually, <laughs> challenges the law that was passed by Congress in 2016. That was the only thing that Puerto Ricans were happy with about PROMESA. And it's all related to these insular cases that I'm gonna talk about. These are cases, the, the reason I bring them up is because they are still determining what happens in Puerto Rico today. Any other questions? All right, so a little overview. Last week we talked about how from the second half of the 19th century, Puerto Rico attempted in some way <laughs> to gain some degree of autonomy. Not, route, not outright independence, of course, because the movement for independence here wasn't as strong as it was in Cuba. Although there was a movement and, and mostly was led by exiles, uh, Puerto Rican exiles who lived in New York. Um, there is a small moment in which they achieved that autonomy and they do that uh, with, the autonomy, with the Autonomy Act of 1897. As I said, that lasts only about six months. Then, oh yes, of course, there is a typo on my presentation. It's 1897. Um, after the Spanish-American War, whatever effort at uh, getting self-rule or autonomy is erased through the Foraker Act and then um, the Jones Act. As I said, as opposed to all the attempt, uh, all the manifest destiny acquisition of lands that, were, that the United States um, experienced during the 19th century, in the case of Puerto Rico, the Constitution didn't follow the flag. Puerto Rico became this sort of sui generis experimental case that is sort of an island of exception in terms of the law and its relationship with the United States. Uh, first, uh, the island was under military control, then under civilian control, and then finally they become a commonwealth, which is a kind of strange invention um, that hinges on the mis mistranslation of what the Puerto Ricans wanted. Um, and if you read them at the Rios Monge book or chapters for this week, you can see that everybody walked away from the Commonwealth, um, the declaration of the Commonwealth, interpreting that Commonwealth as something completely different. The Americans thought it was one thing and the Puerto Ricans thought it was another. And probably that's why it was able to pass through Congress. Because otherwise, if they knew what the Puerto, Rican, Puerto Ricans thought they were passing, they would have never passed it. Um, and the most important fact, which I mentioned last week, that the divisions in Puerto Rican society 
about their own status, seem to survive from, from one colonial master, master to the other, right? Um, there were some who wanted outright independence from Spain, others who wanted to remain connected to Spain but have more ability to make their own decisions without disconnecting themselves from Spain. And lastly, those who actually wanted to be part of Spain. The same thing happens, the same exact thing happens here when the United States arrives. Um, it takes a while for the political parties to align themselves in this way. There was a very strong initial hope that the United States would be different and would bring a different attitude and would bring them the self-rule and the independence that they wanted, uh, some degree of independence that they wanted after Spain, but that doesn't happen and that's really the story that we're gonna tell today. During the 1920s, uh, it is estimated that there were about 10,000 Puerto Ricans that came to New York, different areas of New York State um, in, in Manhattan. Um, as I said, the big wave comes later, and it comes first connected to the Depression and then connected to Operation Bootstrap. So um, the two organic acts or the, the laws that were used to govern Puerto Rico basically until um, the creation of the Commonwealth were the Four Acre Act and the Jones Act. Um, the, the Rios Monje book has a lot of good information on how the negotiations between the two parties and the different politicians, their agendas, which I'm not going to go into here today, um, but it is very interesting that it wasn't that the American politicians were completely disconnected from the desire of Puerto Ricans to make decisions for themselves. If we think back on those images, right, that we saw from the cartoons last week, right, the historical cartoons of looking at Puerto Ricans as people that needed to be civilized, that had to be educated, that Puerto Rico was some sort of um, school for democracy, right? Uh, the idea was, if you want to couch it in benign sounding language, <laughs> the idea was that they needed to learn to govern themselves that weren't suited to govern themselves yet, which is why in the Foraker Act, um, all of the power of decision making is in the hands of the President of the United States, right? Um, there was a discussion also at the time about giving them citizenship. And it is decided not to do it because it was too controversial. And this connects to the question that you asked before about that nativism that was on the rise right at the end of the 19th century and begins to sort of climb up uh, as a policy issue. And the Foraker Act then becomes really this instrument through which Puerto Rico is controlled economically, socially, and politically. Although, as the video says, and as I mentioned last week, remember we had those, that vivid conversation about how people didn't have shoes, they were in hospitals, there, were no, there was no education. Um, the American government truly begins to develop the island. Right? They begin to build roads, they build schools, although the language of instruction was English, it was in Spanish. Uh, there was a push towards Americanization. Uh, there are some benefits, and there is the reason why the party that, that favored the American presence, uh, the Republican Party, um, they were the ones who were pushing for statehood, for being part of the United States. Um, they are the ones who win the first two elections that are held, uh, which were for local office holders. And again, just like the push from the American government was not to give them citizenship, also the idea was that the franchise had to be limited. I think the figure was that it couldn't go, participation shouldn't be above 70%. That and when we say 70%, we don't, we're not saying 70% of the island, <laughs> we're saying 70% of the people who would actually qualify for the franchise at that moment. Um, this position by the United States uh, that we see embodied in the Foraker Act becomes much more difficult 
after the Jones Act and after World War II because the language that the United States was embracing after World War I, and we'll see the same thing after World War II, that has to do with the right of self-determination of people <laughs> made it almost untenable to square that language with the reality of how Puerto Rico was being governed at the time. Any questions? Yes. At the end of World War II, I recall quite a bit of violence involved in, in the U.S. I think an attempt on uh, Truman, uh, mm -hmm. gunfire in the House. Yep, in 54. Were people who weren't very happy. Right, and this is another counterintuitive thing that happens with the creation of the Commonwealth is really the radicalization, in a way, of the Nationalist Party, which really existed since 1922, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. There, it, the, we'll see all this sort of curse current of policy that were happening on the island. Um, but as you point out, because the Commonwealth is created and seems or is supposed to put an end to the status question, at least momentarily, these nationalists feel like the pressure shouldn't be anymore just limited to the island, but those who make decisions for them here, which is why there was an attempt on Truman, which is why there was an, uh, a shootout in the House, right? Um, but there was a movement that was very radical and that was very much pushing for a different kind of future for Puerto Rico, and they felt after the Commonwealth that they had no one to talk about with in Puerto Rico itself, which is why they turned to the United States. Yes, Linda. Uh, just a comment and a question. The, the language issue is not different than what was done with Native Americans, too, where they tried to obliterate them. So it, it's not specific to all Puerto Rico, either, right? That, mm -hmm. the, the question I have is, what was the American interpretation the Commonwealth, what was the Puerto Rican interpretation of the Commonwealth? Excellent, excellent question. I, I will answer briefly and then return to it in about half an hour. Um, there is this kind of, com it's not complicated, it's just dense and convoluted. Um, the Puerto Ricans focus on this idea that what they were signing was a compact which is beyond the treaty in a legal sense. If there's like a hierarchy of things that you can sign between two entities, two governments, uh, a compact is something that no side can break, right? Um, unless there's mutual consultation. The Puerto Ricans felt that they were getting self-determination, a constitution, and a compact, which meant that at a certain point, if they held a plebiscite, about their future, right, between the three options, statehood, status quo, commonwealth, or independence, the United States would have to obey what Puerto Ricans decided because there was a compact. Americans interpreted the commonwealth as you can't accuse us of being colonialists anymore. And part of that interpretation is bolstered by the fact that in the 1950s, as the UN is moving, remember the UN in the 1950s was an entity that was created by the United States because when we think of the UN today, we look back on the last 40 years and think of all the things that we criticize about the UN. But in the 1950s, the UN was a brand new institution that the United States had pushed for its creation. When the UN begins to move to address issues of decolonization around the world, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in other parts of Latin America, in other parts of the Caribbean, they had, according to statute, to report territories who weren't fully independent. And one of those territories was Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico sends a letter to Truman and then a letter to the UN saying, we don't want to report as a territory that is not free anymore because we're a commonwealth. We're no longer a colony. So stop treating us like a colony. 
And this is sort of very in the weeds <laughs> of the discussion of the status of Puerto Rico. But it's something that nationalists and, and other groups on the island really talk about, which is how this discussion of decolonization in the Caribbean, in the UN, in other parts of the world affected how people thought about the issue of Puerto Rico. So while most people on the island wanted to interpret the Commonwealth at, at its most maximalist, right, because of the political pressures in the island, at the same time, they were winking to the world that, they, that the Commonwealth had changed their status and they were no longer a colony because through the Commonwealth, they had a constitution, right? And they could elect their own governor. There were still things that had to go through the United States government that had to be approved. And another thing that rankled con con continuously was that the Supreme Court of, of Puerto Rico couldn't appeal directly in terms of the hierarchy of the court to the Supreme Court. It had to go to the First Circuit or the Second Circuit. And Puerto Ricans felt, if we have this compact and our, our Supreme Court makes a decision, the natural pathway would be to go to the American Supreme Court, not to go through the Federal Circuit now, because we're not a state, we're a commonwealth, right? So it gets very convoluted, as I said. But th that answered your question, right? More or less, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Um, since this is the way Puerto Rico was being treated, however, we had, a, I suspect, other territories, Hawaii. Yes, Hawaii. but ha mm -hmm. Hawaii had, had followed Northern. very early on the pathway of, of territories that had been captured uh, as, as the United States began to expand, expand its boundaries in the West. Um, Alaska and Hawaii became states, they were on the pathway to statehood. And the insular cases, which I'm gonna talk about now, explains in a way why since Hawaii and Alaska, there have never really been any other territories that have become states. I mean, the other one that, that the Virgin Islands, right, the US Virgin Islands, um, and Samoa, which is sort of in no man's land, but that's how they want it and then Puerto Rico. Then there's also the Philippines, but Philippines goes in a different direction, right? That is more similar to Cuba than, than it is to Puerto Rico. Um, I think that what Ray Suarez says in that video is very important. And I think it determines a lot of our conversation here. It was an accident. Puerto Rico wasn't something that anybody really, I mean, Spain wanted it because it was their garrison, right, that protected Cuba and whatever other property they had in the Caribbean. That's where they had the military. And the United States sort of wanted it because it was a gateway towards the Panama Canal. But it wasn't something that they actually thought about for centuries that they should have. So there was a certain ambivalence about what to do with Puerto Rico. They didn't want to have it be independent. They didn't want to have it be a state. So it sort of lingers in this um, no man's land, really, f until today. <laughs> and unfortunately, because the law that rules those decisions comes from, from, from this insular cases uh, that really are almost at the turn of the century, we really haven't, that hasn't really been challenged. Yes. Racial? Yes, the decision was racial. I mean, the the court decision was racial, and part of it, if we look at the um, at the images that were produced at the time, and it wasn't just with Puerto Rico, but also with with Cuba and um, and the Philippines, there was a racial aspect, and and it it fits with the discussion that was being that was that the United States was having at the time because of the rise of nativism. Um, but there was an idea that these people weren't fit to be gov to govern themselves or to be included or not be included. But again, this ambivalence hasn't really been addressed in any way. And I think that 
it will be the most frustrating aspect of having this conversation <laughs> is that when we get to Maria and how the government has dealt with, the, with what happened um, after, during, before, during, and after, still a year later, is the fact that this ambivalence hasn't been resolved and the only thing that people can really hang their hat on if they want to argue for or against is this case law that comes from the court that offered, that, that decided uh, Plessy v. Ferguson, so which was probably one of the worst cases in terms of, of racial discrimination. So I think that's one aspect is structural, having to do with the law as it is, and the other one has to do with not really evolving or coming to terms with what Puerto Rico really means um, for the United States. Okay, so the insular cases, as I said, um, they were decided um, really at the very beginning of the 20th century uh, and, really, and determine what were the differences between what was a state and what was a territory. Um, and as I said, the, especially the earliest cases were decided by the same court, by the same people, with the same mentality of what decided Plessy v. Ferguson, which decided separate, right, separate but equal. Although Plessy v. Ferguson was later found to be unconstitu unconstitutional, turned over, right, um, overturned, not turned over, uh, none of the insular cases which were decided with the same logic and by the same court have really been addressed. And this is really the nub of the problem today. Um, there is debate between legal scholars if it's six cases or 12 cases. I'm not gonna talk about all of them. It will be in the notes. But no one disagrees that the first case was down B. Bidwell from 1901. Um, up to that moment, the United States, uh, again, followed the rule that they had been following throughout the 19th century, that if they conquered a territory, the Constitution followed the flag, and that these territories had a future to become state, right? Uh, so this was all true for the territories that had been captured in the West, Southwest, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, <laughs> Alaska. Uh, the federal government's definition of what meant to be a territory began to shift as the idea of building an empire beyond the boundaries, <laughs> territorial boundaries of the United States began to change. Hawaii, which is annexed the same year of the Ameri Spanish American War in 1898, followed the territory model because it, it was put on a path to become a state. Um, but that's not the case with Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines, um, or Samoa. Um, in 1900, McKinley won re-election on a platform that saw these people very much in the image of, remember that cartoon the white man's burden, man carrying the people in a basket, right? That the McKinley view of these islands or these territories was that they were rescued peoples, right? Um, and it was followed very much ideologically by Teddy Roosevelt, um, who praised the, the expansion of the peoples of white or European blood into the lands of mere savages if this answers your question. Um, yes? You said put on the path to statehood. Was that a conscious decision or that's the way it worked out? No, it was a conscious decision. With Hawaii, it was a conscious decision. It was seen as strategic. The reason why Hawaii was taken was strategic. But there is a decision not to do that with these other places, right? There was a promise. This is where it gets a little tricky. And um, we were talking last week about the difference between Puerto Rico and Cuba. 
the, ex the excuse for the Spanish-America War was Cuba. Remember, and I said how Cuba had always been in the imagination as this sort of thing that should belong to us, to the United States. Um, but there had been a promise made to the independence movement in Cuba uh, that the Americans would leave after the war was won. So they kind of leave, except they insert this little thing in the Constitution of Cuba called the Platt Amendment, which is really the basis for what would be later called the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine that I talked about last week. Remember the Monroe Doctrine? The Roosevelt Corollary and the Platt Amendment go hand in hand. And the Roosevelt Corollary said that if there was any issue monetary, it wasn't just the presence of a warring nation taking over, right, which was the Monroe Doctrine, but the threat of lack of self-governance by any of the countries in the region, that would be an excuse for the United States to interfere. And that is put into the Constitution of Cuba, right, the Plan Amendment. And that guarantees that the United States will be involved in Cuba. But in in a not overt annexation way in the way that they were in Puerto Rico, right? In Puerto Rico, it was very clear that this was going to be part of the US. We never really defined what that was at that moment and have been trying to figure it out for a century and a little more, but tried a different model, right, in Cuba. If you wanna sort of see what the path, I mean, you can try and invert the story and see what Puerto Rico would have been if Puerto Rico had been like Cuba and what Cuba would have been if it had been like Puerto Rico. I don't know that the end result would be so different because in the end we made an exception for Cuban immigrants because of the context of the Cold War. We took them as refugees and we had a big wave of immigration here from Cuba. And it sort of coincides with the big wave of immigration from not just Puerto Rico, but other islands in the context of the Cold War, islands in the Caribbean. But the targeting of, of Hawaii as following one path while all these other islands in the Caribbean were following another was programmatic. I mean, they, they had a very specific idea of why that was. So the islands then became foreign but in a domestic sense. So both the United States, but not the United States, right? Um, three, year, three years later, um, this same court considered the Americanness of individual territory, uh, residents in that territory, in the case Gonzalez B. Williams, which concerned a woman who moved from Puerto Rico to New York and was detained as an alien immigrant. The rule, the court ruled that she was an American, but not completely, or she was sort of an American. Uh, she was a non-citizen national, um, which, is, which was a new distinction to the United States and was a designation that was copied from European empires at the time, right? That they were somehow citizens, but not full citizens. It was a sort of lesser designation of citizenship. Um, this, of course, changes with the Jones Act in 1917 when all Puerto Ricans are made Americans, right? But not with all the rights as Americans because they have no representation in Congress and they cannot vote for an American president unless they're here. When they're on the island, they can only vote for their own governor. So. It was a designation, even when they were considered citizens, it wasn't a full designation, right? And all of this is wrapped up in these court cases from the time. Yes? Is the Jones Act also the one that says that you can't uh, have foreign uh, ships coming in? That's uh, it. Through all, through, I mean, that's the whole deal. Not yep. there, just anywhere. Yeah, but it, exactly. The problem is that it's, different if you're a territorial state than if you are Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico is relying on, on 
many things for the United States. And when there is a crisis, a shipping crisis, like during Maria, other states have resources that are not ships. Puerto Rico doesn't because it's, <laughs> because it's an island. So it puts it in a bind that territorial you, states don't have, right? Um, yes, just because the Commonwealth came into existence doesn't mean that the, some of the intricacies of the Jones Act of 1917 disappeared, right? Some of the things that are regulating commerce in Puerto Rico are still bound up in the Jones Act from 1917. We're still stuck. As I said, we are deciding about this territory and what happens with its citizens based on laws that are really from a century ago, exactly a century ago. Um, so this non-citizen uh, national designation is still what American Samoans are, although, as I said before, for, because of quirks in Samoa, they are actually content with that designation. Um, so those are the, the most important cases, the most important insular cases, and as I said, they created almost a state of exception for Puerto Rico that never really got resolved. I mean, the attempts to talk about statehood or independence are attempts to resolve this, but if you try to go through court, you're always, to debate anything about what happened in Puerto Rico, you're always gonna come up against this and decisions that were made later based on these cases. Okay, so um, as I said, the Jones Act passes in 1917. It was the second organic law. Uh, it provided an elective Senate for Puerto Rico um, and a gubernatorial appointment. It creates the figure of the governor, but again, everything was done from the United States. Puerto Ricans didn't really have a voice in who would be their governor. As a matter of fact, the first Puerto Rican governor, man who was a person who was of Puerto Rican origin, gets appointed in 1940s. Most of the cases, the person who was appointed to be governor usually was a friend of the president or somebody who was connected to the insular department. Um, and in some cases, Puerto Rico got lucky. Teddy Roosevelt's son, uh, was governor in the 30s. He seemed to have had a really strong concern <laughs> for Puerto Rico. Um, I think it was last week that I sent you a piece that he wrote for Foreign Affairs arguing for Puerto Ricans to, um, to give Puerto Ricans some degree of self-rule um, to help them, to sort of humanize them in the eyes of Americans. Um, there were also others that weren't such good governors like Winship, who was the governor during the Ponce massacre, which we will talk about um, in a little bit. Um, and as I was saying, uh, most of the decisions, whatever the political parties were in Puerto Rico, and there were quite a few, which we will discuss, who had these three different positions, um, it really didn't matter which party got more seats in the Senate, in the local Senate or not, because all the decisions really came to the, to the Bureau of Insular Affairs. One of the things that is interesting, though, that uh, Rios Monge argues in the book is that the President of the United States actually didn't, it ended up not having as much, much power as he thought in regards to Puerto Rico, because a bureaucracy comes into being in this, Bureau of Insular Affairs, and they begin to present themselves as the only experts who understand what has to happen in Puerto Rico. And depending on who was in that department, decisions could be slow walked or made faster, pushing the bureaucracy begins to push policy in one way or another. One interesting thing, it was a paper that I um, gave you last week, um, that I thought was very curious was about how prohibition worked out in Puerto Rico. I don't know if you guys had a chance to read it. Um, after the Jones Act, 
right after the Jones Act passes, there had to be an election in Puerto Rico for the Senate. And the way the Jones Act was discussed in the US Congress meant that as the sausage of the Jones Act was being made, um, one of the advocates for prohibition decided that part of the reason why Puerto Ricans couldn't govern themselves was that they drank too much. <laughs> and because prohibition was something that was happening in the United States at the time, they insert the clause of prohibition. And after much haggling back and forth, they decide, okay, we'll, we will be good and not impose prohibition on the island. They'll have a referendum on the island about prohibition. And some of the numbers in that article are fascinating about why prohibition actually passes in the referendum, how prohibition became an issue that had to do with, um, it became almost synonymous with independence and nationalism. But in reality, although it passed, it could never really be enforced because as I said last week, part of national production was rum and illegal distilleries, right? So much of what once prohibition passes, this huge office had to be included for the island and all they were doing was closing illegal distills instead of actually capturing um, black market smugglers in Chicago, they were spending all their time doing this in Puerto Rico. But again, this is a little anecdote of how this relationship between the United States and Puerto Rico ends up embodying all these little peculiarities of our own politics being projected onto their politics and how different people, because these were institutions that determined Right? They were supposed to determine what was supposed to happen legally with the island, but the personalities of the people in charge greatly affected how these decisions went. Um, yes, Al. Well, what cabinet department is the Bureau in? Well, first it was, um, it was housed first in the War Department, I guess what is called the Department of Defense today, and then it passed to the Interior Department. Um, a lot of these offices, like the immigration, immigration office, when they begin, they begin in one department and they keep moving from one department to the other. Um, the insular office remains in effect under the interior department until it's discarded. That's interesting because I remember going to a meeting of higher ups in the interior department in the conference room had a map of the United States, which began from the, the, the uh, Mississippi River west. The reason was is that the east was the Corps of Engineers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, think the Corps, <laughs> I don't think the Corps of Engineers was involved in Puerto Rico, though. <laughs> no, but no, my boss was laughing and it reminded me that's what's going on. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. Also, sometimes, I mean, again, <sighs> This is not dissimilar to the discussion having to do with prohibition. A lot of the things that end up happening in Puerto Rico have nothing to do with the internal politics of Puerto Rico, what the Puerto Ricans wanted, or even big movements of politics here in the United States, but bureaucratic turf battles, right? Because Puerto Rico had to be administered. And that administration created a battle within the government about who was going to stand for what, depending on what the politics were at the moment or how much power you wanted to accumulate. The War Department in the end didn't want to be in charge of Puerto Rico anymore. It made sense at the beginning to have it under the War Department because they inherited it after the Spanish-American War. But once it's sort of hanging there for 20 years, right, it actually lasts until 1934, and then it passes, right, into the Interior Department. Um, but again, it, it just gives you the sense of how problematic it was to decide what to do with this island. Every time the people in the island wanted something from the United States, they had to know which button to push, 
in the bureaucracy to get it. Um, and it is no coincidence that the person who is most able to push all these buttons was uh, Munoz Rivera's son, um, who becomes the person who invents this idea of the Commonwealth, who had lived most of his life in New York and the United States and knew Americans very well. And that's how he's able to have the system work for him and create this sort of fiction of independence, not independence, that we're living with until today. Um, so, um, as I said, we go from the Foraker Act to the Jones Act, and that creates these sort of the two main divisions that we have talked about that are similar to the divisions um, that existed during the Spanish imperial period. Now, just like Munoz Marin, when he creates the Commonwealth and answering Linda's question from before about what was the Commonwealth and what was the difference of what the Commonwealth wanted, the United States wanted from it and what Puerto Ricans wanted. Those who didn't want statehood weren't completely honest with what it was that they wanted, right? They didn't necessarily, maybe in their hearts they wanted to be independent, but understood that they couldn't push for independence right away. So they came up with this autonomy or autonomist or self-rule um, conception um, initially. Then, of course, they split up in the 20s and the 30s. But there are two things that are important here. In the context of the issue of citizenship, when the Foraker Act come, I said that they discussed the idea of citizenship and it was next because it was very unpopular with congressmen here in the United States. The reason that citizenship is given to Puerto Ricans in the Jones Act is because the nationalist movement begins to have power in Puerto Rico. And giving them citizenship was seen as a way of diffusing nationalist arguments. It wasn't because the United States had finally made a decision about what they wanted Puerto Ricans to be. It was a strategic move to stop independence from taking hold or being a more popular thing. One of the things, though, that happens with citizenship is that those who wanted statehood immediately assumed that citizenship meant that statehood would follow soon. And in the minds of Americans and American decision makers, citizenship was absolutely and exclusively to stave off the independent movement. They actually were not interested in statehood almost at all. So you have this, again, this tension from the United States. We don't want you to be independent, but we also don't want you to be a state. So you're going to remain in this hybrid position because we haven't really decided one way or the other. They saw political, American politicians saw political danger in both. First, because Puerto Rico couldn't just be allowed to exist in the Caribbean, given what was happening in Puerto Rico, uh, sorry, in Cuba, or what was happening in the Dominican Republic and the canal. They needed Puerto Rico, just like Spain needed it, as a sort of garrison, right? And they were quite a few military bases, American military bases, in Puerto Rico. But also, statehood would be problematic because this is happening just as the quota system was happening in the United States. And embracing this big population as being part of the United States was, was seen as not the thing to do at that moment. So they are American and they can come here but they cannot be citizens and vote in our elections when they're there, <laughs> right? Yes, Al. I just remember we're talking about that. One other factor I suspect is involved is I remember when Hawaii was coming in to the United States as a state, Alaska had to be a package because one would be Republican and the other would be Democratic. There's no Republican in the Caribbean. Well, as I said, there was one party that had been Republican, which was the Republican Party, which was the pro-American party, which was the 
statehood party. But here's where it gets complicated. Because they're Republican and supportive of the United States, but their goal is sort of counter to what the people in American politicians actually want, right? American politicians didn't want them to be a state, but these guys were gung-ho pro-Americans. And they're in control, but only for a very, very short period of time. Because very quickly, Puerto Ricans become disenchanted, right? Because they realize that the United States is not deciding if they're going to be one thing or the other, and they're going to be in, the, in this sort of legal no man's land, which is how we get that quote from Munoz Rimera saying, we don't even have a name, which was true because they took it away from them. They changed it, <laughs> right? And again, not that that was the original name, which was Borinquen, remember, right? But they'd had that Spanish name for four centuries. And it was taken away from them. They had no flag. They had no name. They had no status. They, want that, they wanted that to be defined. And they didn't get some definition in the Jones Act. But it wasn't the definition that they wanted. So that creates a massive disruption in the politics of the island.